All right. Um, let me get the screen turned on and then let's get this started. The recording software had this little like red X next to the cloud, which indicates that it might give me trouble uploading, but we'll just go with it. Okay. Um, let me get the signing sheet started. Sorry for the delay. Um, a couple things. So I graded. Really, they were great. Just keep it up. Um, you, but uh, each team chose to use a little bit of a different format, but in the end, the information I wanted was neat, concise, and it was all there. Didn't have really any comments. Um, there's not much to them this week, but there will be as the weeks uh, progress. So that was that. Um, your week three meeting minutes are going to be due Wednesday at 5, and I'm going to try and do that accordingly. Team member evaluations, they're due Friday at 5 p.m., okay? Um, now, I spent a lot of time this morning, and I had to do a little bit of magic behind the scenes, but I spent a lot of time this morning getting the grade situation squared out on uh, Blackboard. Because I, I, I'll be honest, I really was just sort of, you know, we're sort of going, you know, day by day. Um, there's a point where it's like, okay, I need to start getting this organized. And I think it's pretty well organized on Blackboard right now. Um, I think everything's pretty squared away. When you log in, you should see your attendance grade, which all the attendance grades are posted. You, and you should see each of the main deliverables for this class. Now, like I said, one thing you're not going to see is a be-all, end-all, final average, because the one thing I'm going to keep pretty close to the chest are your uh, individual evaluations. Um, I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal, though. I think you can probably, you know, at least by the end, you should have a good idea of, of how you're doing on the team. and you can. I guess accordingly, but I'll keep you posted if anything goes uh, awry. Are we good? Good so far? Okay. Um, give me one moment. I'm going to turn on this uh, this item on Blackboard uh, if I can get it logged on, and then uh, we'll get started. Give me one moment. Okay. All right. So um, what I want to do today is I want to talk to you a little bit about the spec. Um, have you, any of you ever seen a physical copy of the Astro Bridge Code? How big is it? It's so big you need like two or three three-ring binders to put it in there. Seems scary, doesn't it? It's not, okay? First off, for the design of any one bridge, you're not going to use all of it. You're only going to use portions of it. Second, um, when you start breaking it down, it's really not that bad, and that's kind of what I want to do today. Um, I didn't get a chance to upload some of these lecture notes. Don't worry, I'm going to do that before. Um, I want to go through some some fundamental basic stuff about, um, about LRFD. Some of this I'm going to go through real quickly because I know what your background is in steel design and concrete design because I'm the one that kind of taught it to you. So um, I'm going to gloss over a lot of the reliability stuff quite quickly. Again, if you're worried about like taking notes or anything, don't, don't worry. I'm going to give you all these notes and really worry about that. What I am wanting you to do though is maybe follow along in some of the sections in the code because that's going to become pretty, uh, pretty relevant. Um, so I want to start off with a very fundamental, basic discussion, and we've had this discussion before because I'm going to go through this, so I'm going to go through this quite quickly, and that's how exactly do you go about design in general? And you know, the, our, I'd say one of the, the easiest methods uh, is to use a factor of safety. So if you're designing a foundation uh, or something like that, and the math tells you that the nominal bearing capacity of uh, spread footing or what have you is 100 kips. I made that number up, but let's just go with it for the sake of discussion. Um, that would be its nominal capacity. That would be how much that particular spread footing can stand before the foundation gets to fail. And, you know, I could specify that, but if I include a factor of safety of, let's say, two, well, then that uh, uh, leads to a difference between what is its nominal capacity, in other words, what is really how much it can hold up before it's going to fail, and what is its allowable capacity, what I'm going to say uh, it can hold up. And in that instance, the factor of safety is two, right? Makes sense. Now, that's great and everything for foundations and for basic design, but for us, when we're doing some more intricate, complex work, the um, the use of ASD has some disadvantages. Uh, mainly, it doesn't handle uncertainties quite well. It doesn't handle 
the uncertainties associated with load estimation, you know, uh, different probabilities associated with dead loads and live loads. It doesn't handle that very well. It doesn't handle uncertainties associated with material quality and fabrication tolerances and the human element uh, involved in construction. So, you know, we recognize that when we um, when we design in the world of structural engineering, we handle that through the use of uh, reliability-based methods, and those reliability-based methods are centered around a philosophy called LRFD, load and resistance factor design. Everybody in this room should know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Remember, uh, dead loads and live loads, uh, well, for in this case, I'm talking about load resistances, but it can go to different load cases as well. Loads and resistances occur at different probabilities, so they have different means and different standard deviations. Um, if you look at this from a bell curve perspective, there is no structure that is perfectly safe. That's, we can't do that. Uh, what we can do is manage our acceptable level of risk through probabilistic uh, methodology. So when you use 1.2 times the dead and 1.6 times the live, that's what you're doing. You're applying appropriate factors of safety associated with uncertainty such that you're achieving a design that has an not just an acceptable level of risk, but a uniform level of risk. So when you design a structure and you design a structure and you and you and you, you're all designing to the same risk level. Okay? And that's the that's the general idea behind LRFD. And and in and, and, and steel and concrete, we talked about how loads and resistances have different uh, probabilistic uh, tendencies, and we say, all right, here's the um, the 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 you know the system function or the resistance minus the loads. Obviously we want the structure to be safe, so our goal is to try and um, our goal is to try and control the probability of failure, the area under the curve on the other side of the axis. You all remember this stuff from steel and concrete, right? Now, the long and short of it is, you know, this stuff works. You know, this is that now. Now we can actually talk about this because I, I remember when I brought this up, I said, well, this is before and after the adoption of the bridge spec, and in steel and concrete, I said. While it's about the bridge spec, you know, it still means saying, well, now we're talking about bridges, okay? Before and after the adoption of LRFD, you see a, a very um, more precise and tight control over the reliability index. The reliability index is essentially how many standard deviations you are away, your mean is away from, from incipient failure, I guess, if you want to look at it like that. And after LRFD, the scatter of our reliability indices was uh, is quite low, so LRFD works uh, works pretty well uh, in achieving a uniform level of safety. Okay, and you all know that the fundamental philosophy is, you know, your nominal resistance is adjusted by a resistance a uh, resistance factor we call phi, right? So phi mn, remember phi vn, phi pn, all that. We have loads where we modify those by a given load factors. We have 1.2 times dead, 1.6 times alive, uh, et cetera. That was for buildings. For bridges, the loads are going to be a lot different. Okay, So we are going to combine those in the same way. We're going to have different load combinations, but the load factors themselves are going to be a little different. Like, for instance, it's not going to be 1.2 uh, times dead plus 1.6 times alive. It's going to be more like 1.25 and 1 1.5. Live load factor is going to be 1.75, so it's going to be a little different. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, our ultimate goal in LRFD is that the RN has to be greater than or equal to the loads, uh, the sum of the, the factored loads. There's a little bit of a new factor that you're going to see in the bridge spec, and that's this this eta term right here. We didn't do that in uh, in building design. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you what's a bunch of junk, and we're going to ignore it. Okay, and and you'll you'll see why here in a second. But uh, don't let that freak you out. Um, everybody good so far? Okay, let's talk about ASHO. Let's talk about the ASHO bridge spec. It's big. It's massive. I want to try and allay some of the concerns. Okay, so the code is broken down into 15 sections. We're going off the 2014 spec. There's been some tweaks since then, but not really anything that's going to matter to us a great deal. So I'm just really not going to worry about it. Um, the code's broken down into 15 sections. Um, there's the introduction, which is really short. We can go through that today. We actually might. Um, general design and location features, that's going to be applicable to all bridges, but it's some pretty general basic stuff. I say the real meat of the code doesn't begin until you start getting into sections three and four. Section three is on loads and load factors, so all, everything associated with loads, whether you're dealing with the steel bridge, concrete bridge, what have you. Um, 
four is on structural analysis. We're going to spend a little bit of time in there when we look at live loads, particularly live load distribution, because that's a new topic. That's something we never covered in structural analysis or steel or concrete, but it is a topic that is very fundamentally important to bridges, so I want you to be aware of what that stuff is. Then you get into your real heavy hitters of the code, chapter five and chapter six. Chapter five is on concrete, chapter six is on steel. We will not look at chapter seven. <laughs> We're not gonna be designing any aluminum bridges. We're not gonna be designing any timber bridges either. Um, so, let's move past that. No, no logs covered with asphalt. We're not, we're not doing that. We're not in California. Section nine. <laughs> Section nine is on decks and deck systems. You're gonna find that depending on the type of bridge that you design, the deck system is either gonna be really simple or if you all decide to go with some like you know, segmental slab type bridge or something, it might be the entire bridge. So um, it's something to think about uh, when you start vetting your concrete alternatives. Um, foundations, and we'll get into walls, abutments, piers, buried structures, so culverts, things like that, railings, joints and bearings, and then sound barriers. Sound barriers is actually a relatively new addition to the bridge spec. I mean, it's, they're not new, it's just they weren't regulated by the bridge spec. So that, that's actually somewhat new. Okay, I actually want you all to open the spec if you've got the ability to do so, and I want you to go to section one. Now, now be aware, the um, opening the spec, there's gonna be like, I'm guessing like 20 to 30 pages of a bunch of junk, like, like, like no, I'm not saying it's junk, but like, like uh, uh, four words and tables of contents until you actually get to section one. In fact, I'll, let me, sort of give you kind of an idea on your on your printouts. Okay, so okay. So like I'm on sixteen okay, so the first fifteen pages are just, you know, I don't say junk, but it's really not the specification. The specification begins on page sixteen. Um, You'll notice that a lot of the sections are actually organized in a very uh, similar fashion. You know, the first, very first thing you'll see in a given chapter is usually on scope, uh, a section of what this is used for. If you get into the, um, like steel or concrete, you'll see scope, you'll see uh, other references and specifications that it's referring to. So for instance, if it's the concrete chapter, it'll probably refer to ACI and AS and stuff like that. Um, you'll see that. One thing I do want you to pay attention to is this. It might sound silly, but chapter at the beginning of each section are definitions, are terms. And a lot of this is pretty simple, like what's a factored load? I think by now we all know what a factored load is. But as you move forward, there's going to be terms that, that are referenced in the spec. And if you go, I don't know what that means, it's probably because it's delineated right here. Another thing you will find typically at the beginning of a, um, a given chapter, let me just scooch to another chapter. Let's go to like chapter three or something. Chapter three is a good one. The, yeah, here's a good one. Okay, so like here's chapter three. The first thing that you see is a scope. Then you see definitions, like what is a berm, what is a damper, what is a design lane, and so on and so forth, because like one thing you'll find in here, the design lanes that we use in bridge engineering are a lot different than the design lanes that say a traffic engineer would use. Like for a bridge engineer, like I don't give a damn where the paint is on the road, that doesn't matter to me. Um, what I'm more interested in is where the truck can go to maximize load on a given girder. I, I don't care about the paint on the road. So, so that, that doesn't really matter to me. The lanes actually move to produce worst case scenarios. So that's, that's something to, you know, to keep in mind, but if stuff like that that's confusing, go to the terms. Um, one thing that you'll see past a definitions uh, list is a notation list. Every symbol that shows up in every equation in that chapter, you know, for instance, if you see the letters AEP, it's not referring to the power company. 
It's referring to apparent earth pressure for anchored walls, okay? So when you see that term in an equation down the line, you go, what the hell is AEP? Go back to, to the notation list. That seems pretty easy and for simple, like, I don't think you need to go to a notation uh, equation to know what FC prime is. I think everybody knows what FC prime represents. It's the compressive strength of concrete. Some of them go here. That's what they're for, okay? So everybody okay with that? All right, let me go back to section one. So section one, so scope, definitions, and then right here, design philosophy. So it all begins with design philosophy, you know, step one. That's one of the reasons why it's the very first thing that we discuss, not just in here, but in steel design, concrete design. Um, it's like day one, we talked about 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live because we need a philosophy in order to uh, approach design. Now our limit states, this should be a very familiar equation, right? VRN needs to be greater than or loads. The one thing that's a little new is this term right here, okay? This little eta sub i, okay? Everybody see that? We never talked about that, and I never talk about it past this, and here's why. Um, okay, let's talk about these load modifiers. If you go said these eta terms are load modifiers, okay? And they're they're the product of three individual terms. A modifier that relates to ductility, a modifier that relates to redundancy, and a modifier that relates to operational importance. Okay, and let me explain what those mean. Um, so, so first off, ductility. Uh, you all know from when you took mechanics materials or civil engineering materials, or hell, when you took me for steel or concrete, that ductility is a parameter that we really, really like in, in, in bridges. Okay, or in, in structures in general. Um, remember, ductility is an ability of a material or element, beam, what have you. It's the ability to withstand forces far beyond the elastic range. If, a, if we're talking about pure concrete, pure concrete is a material that is very brittle, right? Once it goes, it goes quick, right? So if you have a material, let's say, that is very, very brittle, the code responds by saying, okay, this operational uh, uh, factor or this factor relating to ductility. Now what it's doing is it's modifying the load. So if you have a really brittle element, you need to bump your loads up. Does that make sense? So if you have a, a value that's like 1.05, that would indicate poor performance because it's modifying the loads. If it's 0.95, like a really, really ductile element, um, well then we would uh, have superb performance if you, if you, were, you know, something like if it was a pure steel element. Steel is a very, very ductile material, so we could probably use 0.95, okay? Everybody okay with this? That's ductility. What's redundancy? Redundancy is uh, the ability of a given bridge or a given system to withstand loads uh, in the event of the loss of a main member. So everybody's heard about the silver bridge, right? Out in Point Pleasant, don't remember that? The Mothman did not bring down the bridge, okay? No, 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 the Mothman didn't, no. no. Oh. I love this show. <laughs> no, um, what's that? How? But, but if, if we're taught, let me, let me go back to the actual collapse mechanism of what happened with the silver bridge. One main member failed and the entire bridge collapsed, okay? That is a bridge that would be classified as non-redundant. There are plenty of instances of bridges that have, have suffered main member failure and are found to be, in fact, redundant. Okay, so redundancy is the ability of a bridge to withstand loads in the event of a main member failure. I-35, that was a non-redundant system. One of the gusset plates failed, whole bridge came down, okay? Operational importance. This one, uh, there's not really so much of a design aspect for it, but it, let me ask you this. What do you think is more important? A bridge on a farm carrying some cows to the grain silo or a bridge for the trauma wing hospital? I gotta be honest, I think the bridge carrying ambulances to the trauma wing of the hospital is a little more important. I just 
just saying. They're moving next to it. I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. My coffee hasn't kicked in. No, but, but my point is that, that um, some owners or deities would like to classify um, certain bridges as being more important than others. It's not, it's not a matter of, of um, saying, well, well, I like this bridge better than the other. It's how, how much impact would this bridge have on society if it collapsed? Okay, you know, again, uh, uh, an agricultural or or local, even local installation might not be as important as, you know, let's say this this cable stayed bridge over here carrying traffic across the state line. That one's a little bigger and a little more important. Okay, so there's something to be said about that. Now, these factors are great. Here's why they're a bunch of junk. Um, these factors were put in the specification as placeholders. So the, the AASHTO LRFD bridge spec was actually first written back in 1994. And what happened was they knew they wanted to handle these factors, but at the time they really didn't know how they wanted to handle them. So what they did is they installed these sort of dummy factors inside the specification. See, what you find is it, it's, it's really easy to develop a specification and get things into a specification. It's really hard to take something out but once it's in there, it tends to stay in there. So the folks who wrote the spec, they said, well, well, let's give these parameters, which we think are important, let's give them a home inside the specification, and then later on, we'll come back and fix them. And that's where we're at today. So if you ever have a boss or an engineer who says, well, we need to look at these factors, they're placeholders, okay? Um, and plus, there are locations in the spec that handle some of these parameters a lot better. Like there's a ductility check specifically for composite steel beams that would handle this a whole lot better from a behavioral standpoint and from a computa computational standpoint a whole lot better than just some .95 on the loads. So in most cases these values are going to be one and they're multipliers. So what's anything times one? It's itself, right? So we can ignore them. So that, that's that's all that we that's all that there, there is there. Any questions on that? So what I'm trying to do, if you're wondering why I'm harping on particular issues with this, um, with this uh, discussion, the reason why I'm harping on particular issues is because when you all do research on your own to design and com do computations for your bridge, what I'm trying to do is cover the stuff that I think is going to confuse you. I'm not telling you everything, but there are some things that I think are going to confuse you down the line, and I don't want you to come up and think, well, what ADA value do we use? Now you know why. Now you know you need to use one, and here's why. Okay, that, That's the type of stuff I'm trying to cover uh, throughout these next couple weeks. So hopefully hopefully um, you'll see where this is going. Okay, now, there's, now let's talk about limit states. This is something we kind of touched on in some relative detail in steel and concrete, but I want to get a little more in, uh, in, in a little more detail in here. So let's talk about uh, limit states. So do you all remember in steel or concrete what the difference between a strength limit state and a service limit state was? Do you remember that? That's, that's, that's a really good way of putting it. So, so um, uh, service limit states are really more for day-to-day -day use of the structure. You know, does the structure operate well under normal conditions? Whereas strength limit states are worst case scenarios and they are, you know, if you don't pass a strength limit state, the bridge is failing. They're safety checks, okay? So uh, we've got a few more limit states that we're gonna check, or going to uh, consider though and I want to talk about those. So strength limit states. Strength limit states are the ones that ensure the strength and stability of the structure. So these are ones that are like, if you fail, the, uh, if you fail this, people are going to die. So these are where statistically significant load combos come into play. You know, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, we were theoretically checking strength limit states the entire semester. Remember, however, we didn't use load combos for service limit states, like deflection, because that's not what they are. Service limit states are just restrictions on stresses, deformations, cracking, things like that. And these are just under regular day-to-day -day service conditions. Okay, These are not going to be calibrated using some statistical methodology. These are 
a lot of experience related provisions like when we use a live load deflection limit of L over 800 there is no mechanics or statistics that goes into that that's just engineer engineers getting together and going that's about what makes sense okay so there's there, there's not really going to be much uh, mechanics built into that okay here's some new ones this is fatigue now we mentioned this a little bit in steel but I want to get a little more into this because this is going to matter quite a bit in here so the design life of a highway bridge in the United States right now is taken at 75 years. There's actually discussion to move that up to 100 years, which, okay, that's a yeah, discussion in and of itself. But um, right now, it's, or at least for this specification, 75 years. Now, there's 365 days in a year, okay? Now, let's say that the average daily traffic on a bridge is 1,000 cars a day. Do the math. That's a lot of loads, right? 1,000 times 365 times 75. That's a lot of different vehicles that go on a bridge uh, in a given day. Now, for us, of course, all we care about is trucks. Like, I let's be honest, when we're designing a highway bridge, I don't care about Honda Civics, okay? We get Honda Civics for free. We're interested in exclusion-type vehicles, you know, semis, concrete mixers, he heavy exclusion-type vehicles. But even then, um, uh, even then, the, the number of, uh, of, of occurrences that can go on, uh, on a bridge in its given lifetime, that can be in the millions. So what you can find is that, and this is really particularly true of steel, but I, there, there are checks that you need to assess across the board. Over time, that repetitive cyclic loading uh, scenario can result in some, uh, it can result in some capacities that are far below like its yield stress. Like there are some fatigue categories where the yield stress is 50 KSI, but the fatigue threshold is only like 12 KSI. So, that can definitely affect, you know, its long-term performance down the line. So that's just something to keep in mind. Last one uh, is extreme events. We're really not going to worry about this, but I just want you to get a kind of an idea of where this is coming from. So extreme events are really big ones. So if you've got a pier in the middle of the Kanawha River and a barge come crashes into it, that's an extreme event. You know, an earthquake, that's an extreme event. Um, a catastrophe, that, that, that's what we're talking about here with extreme events. I'm not really going to make you all worry about that for your design, but I just want you to uh, be made aware of it. Now, a lot of these loads and load factors are discussed in section three. So I want to I take a look at section three in the spec. So I want everybody to turn to that. I want to say it's something like 58, you said? Okay. So here's, here's, the, uh, uh, here's the specification, and we've got the scope, definitions, notation, and all that. We can move past that. Okay, so load factors and load combos. So first off, the, the total factored force effect is just the sum from a particular load combination. I think everybody knew that. But I want to get into these different limit states. Now, when we're talking about the strength limit state, each one of these limit states, like it says strength one, strength two, strength three, each one of those is a load combination. So if you remember from steel design, we would have like 1.4 dead. Then we would have 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. And then we would have this and this and this. Well, think of each of these as its own particular load combination, but each of them have an intended purpose, okay? They each have a reason behind them. So, for instance, strength one. Strength one is the basic load combination related to just normal everyday use of the bridge without the effects of wind. I don't care what bridge you design in this class, you'll be checking strength one. Period. You know, everybody's checking strength one. Strength two. This is the code's way of accommodating if Nebraska or Idaho or Nevada or some state says, we have different design vehicles that we need you to check. In other words, strength two, load combination relating to the use of the bridge by owner-specified special design vehicles. Evaluation uh, uh, permit vehicles are both without wind. So if you were designing this bridge on a coal resource transportation system road and we had coal trucks going on this bridge, we would need to design this bridge for heavier effects of live load. And we would technically be, uh, according to the ASHRAE spec, be operating under strength two. When you open the Kentucky uh, State Bridge Design Manual or the Pennsylvania one or the Maine one or what have you and they have special vehicles, this is just their 
the code's way of accommodating state-specific provisions. Does that make sense? Yes. No, the, the, they're not. They're not heavy enough. They're, I mean, we're, the let, let me put it like this: the standard minimum design vehicle by itself, unfactored, is seventy-two thousand pounds. We're not. You won't see that for a plow truck. You, I mean, now fully loaded trucks with you know like coal trucks. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to look at you know maybe if. if if you had a plow truck and it was fully loaded with like road salt or something, but I doubt you're going to come close to a load like that. So, does that make sense? What what it's more about is if you're a state that has a particular, let's say, like commerce route, you know you're going to get a lot of heavy truck traffic on it. Or what if you're a state that you know has manufacturing sectors and you know there's going to be a lot of equipment that's going to be traveling along this given road like a lot of large-scale heavy equipment okay those bridges are probably going to be ha have to be designed for something special Does that makes sense That's a good question, um, and you're going to laugh. My answer is really no, and, and, and here's why, okay? A couple things. Um, the load trucks that are specified in those types of uh, uh, systems, like CRTS routes or other exclusion vehicle type routes, the vehicle loads are usually specified, and they're specified on just an axle basis. Like when we... When we um, when we do a two-dimensional analysis of a bridge, we're actually just loading the axle on, on the bridge. So, for instance, our, our, our HL93 has a front axle that's eight kips and two rear axles that are 32 kips, okay? Well, the rear axle is 32 kips. We're really not asking whether it's 16 and 16 or maybe it's, you know, 18 and 14 or maybe it's 20 and 12 or whatnot. We're just saying the entire axle weighs 32 kips. Let me say this. Let me, let me also qualify that answer by saying this. I'm talking about simple bridges. Okay, I'm talking about when I say simple, I mean run-of-the-mill, average, straightforward structures. If you have something that's very geometrically complicated, like a uh, one that has a high degree of horizontal curvature, or it has a, a fairly large skew angle, or something like that, where you have to do a three-dimensional analysis, well then yeah, then you are considering not just the axle, but each individual wheel. And you're right, you may need to consider something like that. It's very possible that in those scenarios, an unequal distribution of weight along the axle could result in a higher level of stress on some given element. That is entirely possible. But for most run-of-the-mill, average, straightforward bridges, you're not even looking on a wheel-to-wheel -wheel basis. You're just looking at the whole axle, so it really doesn't matter. We're not looking at cross-section design either. We're looking at design also along the span. It's a little different, you know what I mean? That, but that's a good point, though. I would imagine, though, even if that were the case, um, and forgive me, I'm not a highway design guy, so it's been a while since I've, I've done stuff like that, but I'd imagine that there's a accepted tolerance that, you know, okay, here's the truck, but we're going to assume a this much unbalance as per some specification. So. Make sense? This is good stuff. Everybody good? Okay. So strength three uh, is the load combination relating to wind. Strength four, I, I, I'm going to quiz you on this one right now. Strength four, load combination relating to very high dead to live load force effect ratios in bridge superstructures. At what point, when do you think that's important? During construction. During construction. Exactly right. But it's also, the it, funny thing is, it's also important for like really ridiculous structures like Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, that structure has a very high dead to live load ratio. It gets the trucks for free. So um, it's more about, you know, just if you can get the damn thing up, then, it, then it's good. So this point uh, to bring up. Okay. <coughs> All right. So. Um, Difference between strength three and strength five. Strength three has is about very high winds. Strength five is around is about normal winds. Um, we're going to avoid uh, extreme events. 
But one thing I do want to point out is what's going on here and here. Now, we talked about this uh, a fair about more in steel design. Everything, uh, if you look at a given page, everything on the left side of the page is the code. These are the directions that you follow. Everything over here, this is the commentary. Okay, so you'll notice the way it's lined out. I mean, the, this is one of the reasons why the Ashdod bridge spec is as long as it is, is because of this right here. Um, hold on, I'm gonna use the snipping tool because I think it's the easiest to explain. Okay, you wanna know why? Here's why, this is why. Okay, so, this part right here where it says strength three, see this bullet point? This paragraph is associated with that bullet point, okay? And the next bullet point will not start until the commentary is exhausted. So see where it says strength four, load combination relating to very high dead to live load force effect ratios, da 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 da? All of this is explaining that, okay? So you won't see any more code written until that's fully explained. So it's one of the reasons why the, the bridge specification is as long as it is, because it adopts this dual code and commentary presentation model. In, in fact, I believe that if the code and the commentary were separate documents, like they are in the steel manual, remember the steel manual, remember the, the pages with the gray, remember that gray lining, that was the commentary, but the stuff in front of it was the code. I bet that the bridge spec would be a lot shorter. And I have seen provisions that were that long, and the commentary is like eight pages, you know, just to explain that. And, and sometimes that's necessary. I'm not saying it's not necessary. I'm just, that's one of the reasons why the book is so long. I'm trying to assuage your concerns down the line when you see some massive book. Oh, my gosh, what the heck is that? So, sound good? Yes. The idea is that if you have winds that exceed 55 miles per hour, that that would indicate that you would have less traffic on the road. So you'd have an instance where you have really high winds, but then an instance with normal. Here, here's a funny one, okay? Um, here, here's one that's even better. So dead loads on the bridge. The, in one category, you have the beams, the slabs, the form work, the cross frames, all that. We call that DC. Another category solely by itself is the asphalt. We call that DW, the future wearing surfaces. The reason why is because when engineers specify a certain thickness, they end up getting a lot more. There's actually a lot more variability in what the engineer specifies and what they get for wearing surfaces than there are for just the self-weight of the structure itself. So we actually use a different load factor for wearing surfaces than we do for just the self-weight of the structure. So because of that, that's DW. DC is just the self-weight of the structure. I blame the paving folks. I blame the paving. And folks around the shuttle buggy, that's who I blame. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Everybody okay with this? So I'm not going to go through every one of them. I do want to go through the load combo table, and then I'm probably going to call it because we are actually running a little bit on t uh, out of time. Um, I want to look at this. So, oh goodness, come on. Okay, so here's, uh, and I'm going to post this so that you all have that. But I want to take a look at this. So this table, this table three four one one, this is actually the load combos. And I know it doesn't look like it. So for instance, for strength one, any of the DC, DD, DW, DH, these load factors are coming from here. If it's live load, the factor is 1.75. If it's friction forces, the factor is one. And thermal aspects and so on and so forth. So everybody kind of see this? This gamma sub P, this is a load factor for permanent loads. Um, if you go to permanent load effects right here, dead load factors actually have a range. 
And the reason why they have a range is because if you really have an odd span arrangement, um, you would think, well, this case scenario, just use the maximum load effect, right? Or maximum load factor. A dead load could actually serve to create uplift on the other end of the structure. So because of that, you kind of need a maximum and a minimum range. We're never going to worry about that. So we're only going to need a load factor of like 1.25. We'll never use the minimum because we're not going to deal with a bridge that's that complicated in here, I guarantee it. <coughs> but notice how there's different, um, there's different load factors for, for, for different even dead loads. So load factor for strength four, why would strength four have a different dead load factor? Strength four is the one that relates to high dead to live load ratios during construction. It would make sense that in that scenario, the dead load is going to be a little more important, right? <coughs> make sense? So when, it all, when it's all said and done, I've broken this down into some very fundamentally basic um, load combinations. So like strength one, goodness, give me a fire truck. Goodness, all right, so for strength one, what's that? Um, thank you. Uh, for strength one, you know, for instance, our load combo is 1.25 times DC. DC is going to be the weight of the, the self weight of the structure by itself. DW is going to be wearing surfaces and, and live loads accordingly. Some of these terms, like what the heck is DW and what the heck is DC and what is live load plus impact, if, if all, any of these terms are a little confusing, don't worry. We're going to go through in very significant detail how you would compute those. And we're going to do that actually starting next time. So um, don't worry if, if some of the details sort of hit you like a bucket of water. Come over the next couple days, I think you'll see how this goes very well. Everybody good so far? Okay. One final note, if you haven't already done so, I would begin, you know, your, your research into other types of bridge systems. I mean, I'm using a steel bridge because computationally, it makes it a little easier for us to do that in class, but there are pre-stress bridges and, and, and post-tension segmental boxes and, and all different types of systems. It's your responsibility in a class like this to start vetting those systems for getting scheduling estimates together. would begin that process. Probably in the not too distant future, we're going to specifically talk about the alternatives that you all have come up with of what you need to do to get those into a a uh, uh, presentable state. Sound good? That's all I got. I will see you all on Wednesday. Don't forget your meeting minutes are due.